volumes because the gamma volumes tend to be larger than within the temperate zone. Now, this large temperate uh, gamma uh, hypervolume could be the result of many different things operating. We tend to see then these larger volumes at the interface between the tropics and the temperate zone. So maybe this is an intermixing then of different kind of straight tra uh, 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 tra tra uh, um, strategies. But then the faster decay of the beta temperate hypervolume does support the idea that the temperate zone supports a larger range and a greater turnover than uh, functional combinations. Okay, so let's switch gears and talk about phylogenetic approaches. And so we wanted then to return to these same data and then ask, well, what do patterns then of phylogenetic diversity say about these underlying patterns of diversity? And so to do this was actually quite an effort, mainly <coughs> by several folks uh, much brighter than me. Uh, this is Brody Sandal and Nathan Kraft. Uh, Bill Peel and Naim uh, Matassi, who's at uh, iPlant. We collaborated then uh, with Stephen Smith and postdoc uh, Cody uh, at the University of Michigan, where we took the standardized species list then for BN. Okay? So we took the entire number of species then across all embryophytes, across then the New World. We then uh, went to GenBank, uh, focused on seven separate loci, to then develop a base BN phylogeny tree, basically matching um, uh, uh, information for each of these different loci, then with the BN species list, <coughs> we had to do some grafting. Okay, and if you're interested, I'll be happy to, to talk more about that. We did also uh, various different estimates of branch lengths. Again, um, the tree is not perfect, but it is what it is. Um, if you're interested, this is it. Um, so this is um, all angiosperms, gymnosperms, sperms, and bryophytes. Um, this we're using a viewer here with an eye plant. You can zoom in and and check out the location of different taxa. So what we wanted to do is return then to our map then of species diversity, and then ask, well, can we approach maybe several different hypotheses for variation in diversity, but maybe uh, taking the approach of looking at phylogenetic diversity as well. So in general, uh, we have expectations that Tropics then are different in terms of number of species, maybe because of the total area of the size, the geographic area in the tropics are larger, therefore you expect lower extinction, maybe higher speciation rates. Maybe there are more species in the tropics because the tropics are older, right? There's just more time then uh, to, uh, uh, you know, for, for not only the radiation, but also the uh, accumulation of species. The tropics could either be a cradle, okay? That is, they could be kind of holding on and maintaining older lineages, um, in terms of they could act like a museum, or they could be a cradle in terms of actually actively generating that diversity. It could also be that tropics have, because they have more energy, okay, and they're warmer, rates of evolution that are faster. Okay? Now, I'll tell you, I'm not going to be able to address all of these, but these are the types of hypotheses we're now interested in going back and um, assessing. To do this, we calculated a measure of phylogenetic diversity, um, what we call PDI, where we take Faith's original phylogenetic diversity measure, which is then the sum of all branch lengths spanned by the species within a given assemblage. But then effectively standardize or correct then for sampling effects, effectively variation in the total number of species. And so then building on previous work, uh, PDI then is a measure of the phylogenetic diversity of the sample of species. So how many species we see then, uh, well the species that observe them within a given grid cell, and then discounted by the expected value of phylogenetic diversity given a random subset of the total number of species. Okay, so there's a null then component associated with this. And again, this is then divided by the expected standard deviation then of the assemblage. And so for each grid cell, we did this approximately 500 times then to calculate variation in PDI. And actually, we were influenced by actually the work of uh, uh, Davies and, and Buckley um, to um, try to see if we couldn't kind of recreate something similar here in ways for plants. And so PDI can help us reveal unique aspects then of differences in uh, not only evolutionary processes, um, but differences in diversity not, not captured by using just taxonomic diversity. So in general, low PDI can reflect recent speciation rates uh, as well as low rates of immigration. But also high PDI can reflect low rates of speciation um, and or long distance immigration. Okay. 
So in general, what do we find? And so it's actually quite interesting. When we go through and we calculate measures of phylogenetic diversity, red here being high phylogenetic diversity, that is, more than the local diversity, you're actually sampling more across than the phylogenetic tree than you'd expect by chance, versus low phylogenetic diversity, that is, of the species there, they actually come from a much limited and subset then of, of, of the larger phylogeny. We actually see tremendous variability in PDI and then across then the new world. The interesting thing is that we see high PDI in high temperate zone areas. Tropical mountaintops, okay, um, the northeast, okay, even along the coast, but definitely then well within Canada, actually you're residing in high PDI uh, environments. But also look here, uh, Terra del Fuego into Argentina and Chile actually have the highest measures of phylogenetic diversity in terms of measurements of PDI. Low areas of PDI um, throughout the Amazon, but also within the desert southwest. What's interesting is that we see, and we see this repeatedly within each of these different groups, we can break these down by ferns, angiosperms, gymnosperms in general, we see negative relationships between standing stocks of diversity and phylogenetic diversity, this PDI measure. And in general, PDI decreases the species richness. Again, if we then to compare measures of phylogenetic diversity against this phylogenetic diversity index, then with standing and stocks of diversity, what you actually find is that they tend to be more or less mirror images of each other, and that PDI decreases then the species richness. So how do we make sense of this? Well, if we compare patterns of taxonomic and phylogenetic diversity, they can help us at least begin to assess various different hypotheses for prominent then, uh, um, uh, processes happening then across diversity gradients. So in particular, the tropics disproportionately cradle okay, for the generation then of new taxa, or for the preservation of existing diversity. Now it was actually Stebbins that kind of claimed that tropical high diversity, tropical plant high diversity, was due to the lower extinction rates. But what we find because of this negative relationship between PDI and then in richness, that's consistent with a reverse museum effect. So the temperate and high tropical mountains appear to have acted as a museum or a refuge for these longer branch and species. There's the older lineages okay, in the tropics more than as a cradle. At least our first pass seems to suggest that. Again, we point to the negative relationship between PDI and species richness. Um, Brian, yes. just for clarification, this is uh, the diversity that, say, a museum would have while controlling for the actual number of species the museum yes. has. Yeah. Yeah. Right. So for, for a given given observed richness, you have more phylogenetic diversity or less than what So they, the, the museum is actually could be bigger. Is bigger. It could be bigger as relative things in the tropics. Mm -hmm. It's not as diverse given the number of things. Exactly. Okay. So to try to put these various pieces together, the other aspect of changes in diversity that we wanted to look at was a measure that um, hasn't really necessarily been linked to diversity per se, but I think is actually quite important. And that is the distribution of rarity. Where are all the rare things, okay, the things that you don't run into too often. So going back to Simpson, the thought is that tropical mountains will disproportionately generate and contain more rare species. And when I mean rare here, we're also linking not only abundance, but sizes of geographic ranges. Right? So our measure then of rarity here is more almost a global measure in terms of, of its range size. So the idea is that small population ranges and numerous barriers okay, within these tropical mountains will then protect it against not only the spread, but also um, within this, these sympatric um, uh, populations will tend to increase the density then of rare species. And going to Janssen and his why mountain passes are higher in the tropics. And the statement here that I'm building on Simpson is that these mountainous regions in the tropics will harbor proportionally more rare species than temperate mountains or even topographically uniform tropical regions. Okay. So the emphasis here is that tropical mountains in particular are going to be a major engine then in generating then variation and diversity through then rarity. So when we actually look at the distribution of the total number of observations per species, 
Okay, so we go through the entire botanical observations and ask for each species, how many times has it been observed in all the different observations? What we actually find, if you're familiar with the Pareto uh, distribution, is that this is effectively close to a power law, but it's actually a flavor of a Pareto. It's a truncated Pareto. And so basically, we get an approximate power function between number of observations and the total number of species. <coughs> in general, most species within the BN data set are incredibly rare. Over 50,000 species have three observations or less. So literally what this means is that there's little botanical information that exists across the world of herbaria, okay, for on the order of about 34 to 42% of all species then within the Americas. Again, because this is effectively a power function that doesn't drop off, okay, it keeps increasing. Now, we've been quite con concerned about this. It's like, well, it's just a sampling artifact, right? You're not sampling enough. If you sample more, you'll get more observations. It's a bias in collection. Maybe this taxonomic issues. A lot of these names, they could be just old names, right? Taxonomic splits, uncertainty. So what we did, because within the working group, we have several folks associated with pretty prominent um, national herbaria, Missouri Botanical Garden, New York Botanical Garden, and several others, we randomly selected these rare species and then asked, are these really rare or are, is there something weird happening with them? And so what we did was we took then this random then subset and we farmed them out to experts then across these different herbaria and then asked, is this a recent name? Is this an unresolved name? Is this a case where it's actually abundant or have a large range and you're not sampling enough? Is this the case of an invasive species? Because actually, in, within these data sets, we have a lot of invasive, cultivated species that we've been trying really well to try to, to remove them, but maybe we didn't remove them enough. Is this an old name? Is it recognized actually as rare? So indeed, is this a rare species? So we actually went to the experts and asked, you know, how well are we doing? In general, 7.3% of these names are misclassified as rare. So an error. But 7 to 8% have some sort of taxonomic uncertainty, but 72 to 90% are indeed rare species. So based then on this random sample, okay, we think that this is a reasonable first approximation. So what we can ask is, okay, let's go then to these rare species and ask, where are they? Where do the rare species tend to be? These are the raw observation, species observation records. The next thing what we can do is then we can then kind of put this through various different rarefaction kind of samples, but we can correct for the sampling uh, intensity of these different sites. And then we can then plot out where then are these really rare species. Because remember, they disproportionately make up most of the species then within the new world. And what strikes out at you is that their um, rarity is highly clumped geographically. So tropical and subtropical mountains, okay, rare species pile up. Isolated areas, the Mata Atlantica, the Yangon Shield, Southern California, okay, and the Caribbean, okay, also have these little hot spots. But tropical and polar regions, I'm sorry to say, um, even Amazonia are not necessarily areas where species are piling up, okay, because they're rare. So then to summarize, rarity is mainly confined to these tropical and subtropical mountains. In general, this appears to support these ideas from Janssen. <coughs> tropical uh, mountains disproportionately notably harbor, but appear also with our measures of PDI to generate then more species and rare species. Notably, the Amazon basin, okay, despite the relatively high species richness, contains relatively few rare species. And I will point out, we've looked at their geographic range sizes. Within the Amazon, the geographic range sizes are, are notably large. Okay? There's a lot of species in there, but they're all very large range species. Um, don't have time, but there are actually more rare species than you predict by neutral theory. Okay? So you can actually look at those functions and test um, other theories, including neutral theory, for their prediction. I don't have time to talk about that. So I started out talking uh, kind of with the emphasis on, on trying to uh, uh, focus on a few different kind of prominent questions. For a given place within the new world, how many species are there? Um, 
What are the various different hypotheses that best explain the distribution of plant diversity? So then in stepping back, what I've kind of shown is that we've been trying to grapple with these questions in terms of taking the best raw observation data that we can find, okay, going to the primary biodiversity information uh, uh, centers in terms of, of trying then to not only access them, but to make these data accessible. Okay? And so um, this is the overall, the, the BN working group uh, workflow. But we estimate that there are between 92 and 110,000 embryophyte species then within the new world. And this takes into account these uh, potential differences in, in taxonomic names and so on. So that's about 41 to 50 percent of the global embryophyte diversity is actually within the Americas. But to conclude, I've kind of argued that progress in biodiversity science has been limited not only by a primary focus on species richness, but also the quality of our data. But I think now we're kind of at the stage where we have access to reasonable data we can start uh, accessing and uh, assessing several of these different hypotheses. But again, to better identify the nature of variation in species richness, we need to link with other measures of the diversity of life. Okay? And so we kind of focused on three. We focus then on the diversity of functional uh, traits, hypervolumes, phylogenetic uh, diversity, but also differences in rarity as well. And again, these trait and phylogenetic approaches appear to provide more information, right? So we have more information, we can then go back to our theories in order to see what do these theories actually predict in terms of their phylogenetic structure, but also in terms of their functional structure. So again, this is a much more powerful approach to then do a Got to go back to these diversity gradients with more information, trade information, phylogenetic information, variation in abundance to better test these theories. All right, so what did we learn? So for functional trade diversity, we found that actual functional diversity shows a reverse gradient, completely opposite to what we thought it was going to be. Maybe there's greater niche packing within the tropics, but I think we need further study to assess that. We find that abiotic filtering in general is less important now, we've done some additional studies to really assess the importance of abiotic filtering, and it's not really coming out as very important, okay, to my surprise. And these patterns don't fit neatly to each of these existing theories. It may very well be that a combination of, of each of these may be uh, at work. What, what about patterns of PDI, or phylogenetic diversity? Well, PDI is actually highest outside the tropics. <coughs> And we see an inverse relationship between PDI and richness. And again, this is consistent with higher latitudes and elevations act more as museums and lowland tropics. And I don't know if anyone noticed the desert southwest probably reflect recent speciation. But again, again, these are all preliminary, um, but again, suggestive. But what about the geographic distribution of rarity? Most species by far are rare, really rare. 40 to 50 percent have only three to five observations. Rarity is clustered within tropical mountains. That is, most of the diversity we see is actually clustered then within tropical mountains. But I want to leave you with uh, um, a little bit of, uh, uh, kind of uh, uh, some uncertainty here. There are some very important caveats, and it's something that we debate within the working group. There are real issues of sampling, um, geographic biases and sampling that underlie all of this, okay, that still worry me. Um, but we still have to come up with a really good way of tackling variation in sampling. There are also geographic biases that we're trying to deal with, but we've been trying to do that in multiple ways, and I think all the various different patterns still appear to hold. There are issues of range modeling accuracy, different flavors of range modeling. We still have issues of cultivated species. This actually is a very tricky issue. Um, uh, gosh, I mean, go to any herbaria, and there's house plants deposited in there, there's stuff from the you know, garden and, and everything. And so when we actually looked at the, the original species diversity uh, patterns, we found that there's this amazing peak in species richness in St. Louis, Missouri, <laughs> which is where the Missouri Botanical Garden is, right? And so we had to come up with very clever algorithms to go through and figure out, okay, what is native, what's not. And we actually used biogeography and the known locations, geographic locations of uh, different families and genera to help us weed out what is native and non-native. Um, there's still taxonomic uncertainties, there's still issues of data accessibility, there's still a mountain of stuff that provide important caveats. But, what I would like to leave you with is that tropical mountains appear to generate and harbor most of the diversity. And that the evolutionary processes associated with that are probably the most important in terms of generating the overall gradient. 
And there's still some things we don't understand, in particular, why is the functional gradient completely opposite to what we thought of to begin with? Diversity gradients appear to be consistent with, again, this reverse museum effect combined with the importance of tropical mountains in generating and harboring the most plant species. And with that, I'll, I'll say thanks, but what I wanted to do is I'm going to do a shameless plug. What's great about these data is that now, on your phone, your phone knows where you are, and I can provide that map of all the species. We can now deliver, and this is free, a personalized species list of all the plants in the new world to you um, <laughs> right now. So you can download this on your iPhone. It's called Plantomatic. Diversity for the people, right? You collected this, or taxpayer money collected all this data. This then will give you within 100 kilometers all species that, that occur with, within your location. Um, it will also work without a cell phone um, connection, so you can be in the middle of the Amazon. You can test this. It will give you a species list in the top of the Andes. Uh, if you do have internet connection, you can then click on a species, and if there's a link, you can go right to Missouri. You can then get a specimen and zoom in. So that's, I think, some of the power of these data. Once we get standardized, this is, these are the types of information that we can deliver to people, but also for the science as well. So um, if it wasn't for all of these, these folks, I couldn't stand here. And so I've been very much uh, watching in awe with all the wonderful science that the group has been doing. So thank you very much. <laughs>